We invite you to worship with Tabernacle Baptist Church. Five services, multiple locations. Tabernacle, Maine, 1223 Laney Walker Boulevard, Augusta, Georgia, 715 a.m., 945 a.m., and 1215 p.m. And Tabernacle West, 702 North Bel Air Road, Evans, Georgia, 9 a.m. and 1115 a.m. To outsiders, it must look ridiculous. A people with our past in this country celebrating? How peculiar. But we know a thing or two about ridicule. We were mocked in the fields. Still we celebrated. Scorned by Jim Crow, but we celebrated. Now, fighting to prove that our lives truly matter, we continue to celebrate every sacrifice made, every progress achieved through the Lord Almighty. However undignified, no matter the humiliation, we are on the move. This August, every Sunday at 9 a.m., 11 a.m., and 5 p.m. through Tab Global. Then David got angry because of God's deadly outburst against Uzzah. The place is still called Perez Uzzah, the explosion against Uzzah. And David became fearful of God that day and said, This chest is too hot to handle. How can I ever get it back to the city of David? He refused to take the chest of God a step farther. Instead, David removed it off the road into the house of Obed Edom, the Gittite. The chest of God stayed at the house of Obed Edom, the Gittite, for three months. And God prospered Obed-Edom and his entire household. For the time which is ours, simply just want to think through this thought together. I hope that you are ready and settled and centered to be able to receive this word. And looking from these verses, I want us to consider this idea today when favor finds you. Has been our custom as we once again prepare our hearts to hear the word of God. We simply ask God, Lord, speak. We need to hear. Over the last few weeks, it has become perhaps part of my daily routine. After my moment of prayer and devotion, I love to peruse certain newspapers to catch up on the news, not just from a local or even national level, but even global. And I know most of the news we hear is about coronavirus, but there are other things that are happening throughout the world. And those of you who've been knowing, there was a pretty tragic situation that happened in Beirut, a bombing or whatever took place, an explosion. Something happened, that loss of life, and there was incalculable loss of property. And as I was perusing a particular newspaper, there was this story that arose, that this woman was videotaping her mother-in-law in her bombed out house. Now, I would admit to you that when I first saw it, my thought would be, my assumption, is that this woman would be lamenting to be in her bombed out house. We don't know how many memories that she had in that house. You would assume that she would be lamenting and loathing the lost. But the story says that this woman in a bombed out house was playing the piano. That she was making melodious music in the midst of all this carnage and all of this terror. And I think spoke to me that this woman had the wherewithal to understand that even though her house may be bombed out, she can still make sweet music. And in that like life for you and I, there are times where we seemingly have to make lemonade from the lemons that we receive. And truth be told, that sometimes life can feel like that house, that it feels bombed out. It feels as if there is no good that can come out of this. And it takes spiritual maturity. It takes wherewithal. It literally takes resilience to be able to play our song even in a bombed out house. And for life, that's what I want us to suggest and really want us to really ponder. There's tension there. And, and, and I know that how bad this can be. Life has been turned upside down for many of us this year. 
from a virus of coronavirus, from notions of racial inequality to now having to make the hard decision, do I send my child back to school? How am I going back to work? What about unemployment? All these questions are raised, and I know it's kind of odd in the midst of all of that stuff with all of that background noise. How then can I talk about favor? Because here's the truth about favor. Favor is not fair, but favor does have a way of finding you. And, and that's what makes our text so powerful. Once again, as we're looking at the progression and the procession of the presence of God, once again, David has made the decision that the first act he wants to do as the undisputed king of Israel is to bring the ark of God into the newly minted capital of Jerusalem. They take it from a man by the name of Benadad's house, which is on the outskirts of the territory of Israel, and they begin the arduous journey to Jerusalem. But you know the story as we broached it last week that David had the heart, his mind was right, but he did not do it the right way. And the last time that we gathered that particular moment, Uzzah, in his quest and his preference, tried to steady the ark, and God's anger raged against him. The Bible said that Uzzah dies right there. And in that moment, David becomes distraught. We're not certain if he's distraught just simply because of the death of Uzzah, or is he upset with God? But we do know that David decides to suspend the progression of the ark of God. But he has to leave it somewhere. And the text says that he decides to leave the ark at a man by the name of Obed-Edom's house. And it's intriguing to note that when we come to the conclusion of verse 11, that after only three months, 90 days, Obed-Edom house is prospered and matter of fact the scripture goes on to say that all he did was successful that the interesting tension here is that a moment of disappointment for David becomes a moment of destiny for Obed-Edom a moment of pain for David becomes a moment of prosperity for Obed-Edom and in that interesting that in this moment that Obed-Edom becomes a recipient that even though he was not looking for it he was not clamoring for it favor still found him and I think that's a powerful reminder for many of us in this day and age and so many of us are trying to figure out what's next what's the next season going to offer? When is doors going to be open? This is what our text seems to tell us on the onset is that you don't have to go looking for favor, but favor's looking for you. And for you and I, I think that's a powerful reminder with so much negativity going on with so many things that literally can cause us to be depressed and to feel down. Here's some good news to encourage you. Favor's got your address. And no matter what happens, can I tell you that favor has an undisputed, unconditional GPS system. It does not matter where you are. Favor can still find you. That is the true story of this narrative with Obed-Edom, that the favor of God finds him, and he experiences unparalleled, unconditional, overflowing prosperity from God. And I'm here to declare to those who are listening to me that God can shift some things. God can meander some things. God can move some things and God still has you on his mind. Even if you're not in the original plans of people, you can still be in the main plan of God. God is not constricted to our human ideals, but God is so awesome that he'll sometimes circumvent circumstances in order to bless you how he needs to bless you. I'm preaching to some Obed Edoms out there and I got good news to let you know favor is going to find you. That's what our text outlines for us today. It's a real simple little outline because I know that's the critical question that you're asking yourself. Are you sure, PG, that favor is going to find me? Because I'm stuck in this notion. Here I am in, the, in month eight, and I'm still trying to figure out where favor is. And you are going through trouble and travail. You're having all these questions. But let me let you know favor always knows where you are. And one thing I've learned about God is he may not come when you want to, but he is absolutely, unequivocally, always on time. And that's the thing that we can rest assured in this passage. And as we began to unpack it together, as we look at really what this text can teach us, there are some things about favor that I really want to set the record straight because favor is not just blessings. Favor is not just prosperity, but what we learn in this passage of Scripture it's also the process of favor. Favor in itself comes to us. And this is really honestly the powerful thing for me. How it gets to us is so amazing. 
Because as we were going to, uh, to really lift up what this text says, not only does favor find us, but favor meets us with a couple of conditions. And, and that's what Obed-Edom experiences. And I think Obed-Edom's experience with the favor of God is not a unique experience. You and I, as we look at his life and what has happened in these few verses, can testify that we know how favor can find us. Well, well, here it is. Let me drop these on you. I hope that you're taking copious notes. I hope you drop some amens in the comments section. I hope uh, that you can resonate with what God is speaking to in this moment. Because here in our text, we learn that when favor finds us, this is what we learn. That favor comes our way by way of accommodation. Yes, you hear it clearly. My brothers and sisters, accommodation is what I'm saying is that favor finds a way to get to you no matter where you are. That's what the text conveys. <laughs> Matter of fact, when we read the text, remember, we come at a critical junction where David is now wrestling with despair and he's really wrestling with distress. Uzzah has died. And so now it pauses the plans of David. Because David at this point had done what he thought was right. He was going to bring the Ark of the Covenant from Abinadad's house on the main road to Jerusalem. But then tragedy happens. And so the text says something intriguing that David makes the decision, watch this, to take the Ark off road. This is important. I need you to hear me clearly that David in this moment was on the main road to Jerusalem. Because of this tragedy, he makes a decision. He decides to take a detour. He decides to go off-road, that he was going to leave it at a place that's headed by a man by the name of Obed-Edom. But Obed-Edom's place was not on the main road. In order to get to Obed-Edom's place, it had to go off-road. And that thing shouted me. That's why I'm always challenging each and every one of you to be astute students of Scripture. That things that may seem minuscule and don't seem like they have much relevance, you got to read them because they can speak profoundly. And they have a way of really expressing the nature of God in ways that are profound because uh, this movement of David to go off-road is powerful to me because it shows that we serve a God that don't just bless main road people, but he has a an ability to bless off-road people. You know what off-road is people that's not in the original plan. You know what off-road is people that's not in the original um, prominence or the original dominant cast. But what I appreciate is that we serve a God that has off-road capabilities. That's grateful to us. And I don't know about you, but that's good news. That God has an all-terrain vehicle to transport your favor. God does not need to stay on the nice level road in order to reach you, but he can go off-road. God is able to meet us exactly where we are. And this thing really blessed me because as I look at my life, I can testify. I know I'm not in here by myself, but there's others right there in Tab Global that can testify. You ain't always lived a main road life. You have spent some seasons, some moments, and some situations and circumstances off-road and isn't that like God is that he meets us right where we are that's the power of the gospel to me personally because when I think about how it reached me and there are many others who perhaps would have my same testimony you didn't meet God in the main road you didn't meet God in Sunday school you didn't meet God in BTU you didn't meet no you met God in the off-road you met him in an off-road relationship or an off-road circumstance God is so incredible Incredible that he's willing to take a detour to reach you. At the end of the day, what we see is God decided to shift and transition and change his plans in order to bring the Ark of the Covenant to Obed-Edom's house. <laughs> Omaha, Omaha. That, that's what was coming across the screen. This was in a time of yesteryear. I was actually watching football. It was the Denver Broncos versus their opponent. And guess who was being mic'd up for that game? Their quarterback, Peyton Manning. And he kept yelling out, Omaha, Omaha. <laughs> Matter of fact, it became a national sensation. People were amazed. What was he saying? Omaha, Omaha. And when they pressed him, they asked him, what does Omaha mean? And Peyton said, Omaha is an audible call. If you don't know anything about football, an audible call is intriguing because an audible call is when the original play that was called is changed. What would literally happen is that many times teams would get together in the huddle and based upon what they are thinking the defense is going to do, they will call the play. But when they get to the line of scrimmage, 
and somehow the defense has changed, they give the quarterback the opportunity to call an audible. An audible puts the, the offense in a better position based upon what they see the defense doing in order to be successful because if they ran the original play, they would not have been able to be successful. That many times, if you really get victory, you need to be willing to have an audible. That's good news because God majors in audibles. God is able to take a play you've called and change it for your good. God is always has the ability to be able to shift some things on our behalf and here's the good news I've learned that later on when I did a little more research that Peyton Manning had a, a, a device in his helmet because he wasn't just looking at the field from his vantage point but he had an offensive coordinator that was in the booth above him that saw what he couldn't see that knew what play he needed to run aren't you and I glad that we serve someone that's above us that sees what we can't see and able to make the changes we need to make. That's why some of us can look at our lives and say we have prospered because God called an audible. Omaha, Omaha, he was able to shift some things on our job. Omaha, Omaha, he was able to shift some things in our lives. God has the incredible ability to move off-road if necessary in order to meet our need. This text to me teaches us that favor meets us by way of accommodation but then the text also says favor meets us by way of acceptance. Now I need you to lean in with me for a few moments on this one because this text is not as clear cut and cookie cutter as some scholars want to suggest. Because the text tells us that Obed-Edom, but in some translations he's given two designations. Either he's from the city of Gath or he's called a Gittite. Now this is important. I need you to hear this. Because this is where a lot of tension comes when they're trying to explain who Obed-Edom is. Obed-Edom, the name literally means servant of Edom. Servant of Edom. Who is Edom? Well, some have tried to articulate that Edom might be the name of another god. So how did this man, Obed-Edom, become the caretaker of the ark of God. And what makes it interesting is that a lot of scholarship wants to lump him as a Levite out of the clan of the Korites, whose job becomes that to take care of the ark of the covenant. Matter of fact, he becomes a doorkeeper. In those days, those were not ushers, but people who were able to control the access to those who can get to the ark of God. But what got my attention is this place called Gath or the fact he was a Gittite. Because Gath, when you study it, was one of the five most prominent cities of Philistia. This is where the Philistines lived. Matter of fact, Gath was a hometown of the giant by the name of Goliath and his four other brothers. Gath was also the place that when David was on the run from Saul, he went to Gath to work under the king by the name of Achish for the season that he was working with the Philistines. So here, what's interesting is that when David finds his place of disappointment, he decides, watch this, to drop the ark of God off at someone who had Philistine blood in their life. That's interesting to me because that seems odd. Weren't the Philistines the mortal enemies of Israel? So why in this moment would someone who should be an enemy become a friend of God? Why would someone whose family and legacy has been known to be antithetical not only to the nation of Israel but also to the presence of God now in this moment be entrusted with the ark of God? And I know I can hear what some of you biblical scholars are already starting to surmise. I already know some of you are writing me off saying I'm being blasphemous. I know that you're trying to figure out some scholarly way to be able to say that I'm wrong and you might just be right. But for the sake of the argument, let's just say it is true. This man, Obed-Edom, was not from the original family of Israel. This man, Obed-Edom, literally had came from this enemy's clan. And yet now he's still chosen 
to have favor. I, I know that you're going to try your best uh, to try to say I'm wrong, but let me tell you why I appreciate that vantage point, why I appreciate the fact that I'm hoping that my uh, assumptions about this scripture is right, because what it teaches me is that favor is not excluded from those who are considered foreigners, that just because you weren't raised in the family of God uh, does not mean that favor from God uh, is going to be excluded from you. I hope uh, and pray that my exegetical work of this text is correct because I want to give somebody hope and encouragement to let you know you ain't got to be the one that has fit in or that's been the part of the prototype that people would consider one that deserves the favor of God but aren't you glad that God when it was time to dismiss his favor didn't have to do a, a, a conference call asking people if you were worthy to get his favor but God has the ability to break his own rules to sustain spend his own way in order to bless you right where you are. I ought to have some people looking right at me on the screen that can holler back at your boy in the comment section and says, PG, I know what it is to be a foreigner. I know what it is to look different, to walk different, to have a different background, but still have the favor of God. I may not have my hair like other people. I may not do what other people do, but God has the incredible ability to still extend grace and mercy and benevolence and favor in my life just because I don't fit in with them don't mean I don't fit in with God touch somebody on your cyber screen and say neighbor you can be a foreigner that's been favored by God this blessed me especially in this conversation we're having as a nation as we're trying to figure out the relevance of those who look different, those uh, who are on the margins, those uh, who are ostracized, we're still dealing with a demographic of people who are simply making the declaration that they should matter too. And I got good news to let you know uh, that even if you don't think you matter to other people, even if we're being enthralled with racial tension until Jesus comes back, here's the critical question that I don't have to wait and get an answer for. Because even if I don't matter to other people, here's the good news I'll always matter to God which means at the end of the day it's not about what they think it's about a God that sees me just like I am and I love it because somebody needs to know you ain't got to change in order to press nobody just be you and let God meet you where you are just operate in your gifts and in your skills let your talent come forward and know that you ain't got to make no excuses why because when you are a foreigner that's favored by God uh, that only shows it ain't because uh, uh, you tried to get in the right click but you serve a God uh, that's able to bless you uh, just the way you are this Last couple of weeks have been exciting from this one vantage point that sports have come back. I'll be honest, I didn't think that they were going to reopen. I thought it was going to be too dangerous. As a matter of fact, some leagues have seen how difficult it's been. But there's one league that has done an incredible job of navigating the restart to the season. The National Basketball Association decided to create a bubble experience in Florida. That's powerful to me. Matter of fact, it's pretty much gone off without a hitch. He only had one issue. One young brother decided to get some wings from the strip club. But other than that, it's been an incredible experiment of how to operate in this new season. But man, it's been crazy. Y'all know I'm a diehard Laker fan. And so things have pretty much been going the way they are. There have been a few anomalies. Phoenix has been playing well. Spurs have been playing good. The Pelicans act like they don't even want to win a game. But there's one particular player that everyone is raving about. It seems as if he's came back in better shape. His scoring's up. His assists are up. His rebounds are up. He is playing like perhaps the best player in the league. And I'm not talking about LeBron James. I'm not talking about uh, my man Giannis. I'm not even talking about James Harden, even though he's balling. I'm not even talking about anyone else. The person I'm talking about is a man by the name of uh, Luka Doncic. I know for many of y'all who don't follow NBA, that may sound strange. And yes, you're right. His name is a foreign name because he is a 
foreign player. He's a Slovenian basketball player that got drafted third overall in 2018. It's ironic uh, that he was drafted by the Atlanta Hawks, but you know how all the Georgia teams do. Uh, they get rid of all the best talent. So they traded his rights to Dallas. Uh, and here's what's interesting. He becomes a rookie of the year uh, in 2019. Brother Man has been balling to the point uh, where now they're saying that he has the ability to probably end his career uh, as an all-time great. Now here's what's interesting. If you were to look at him, you would not assume that he can play ball. You know we got some bias and some prejudice. He's white and uh, he's white and uh, he's white. So we assume uh, that because he's white and he's not really that fast. He's not really that tall. Uh, he's not really that athletic. But boy, Luka Doncic can play. He's a foreigner, uh, but his skill set, his ability to play uh, is what's setting him apart. Just because he's not from here uh, does not mean he doesn't have game. And aren't you glad that God is the same way like that that you don't have to fit in you don't have to be from a certain place but God can take a foreigner and still favor them with greatness that's the good news is that favor found him and accepted him just like he was favor by way of accommodation and favor by way of acceptance but there is something else that they also see favor in our text by way of acceleration this text blows my mind because not only did it go off-road and it ends up in Obed-Edom's house, but look at the timetable that is offered to us. Text says it was only there for three months. Ninety days is the length of time the Ark of the Covenant stays at the crib of Obed-Edom. But in those three months, in those 90 days, word gets out that Obed-Edom's house is prospering. Matter of fact, 1 Chronicles chapter 13, which tells the same narrative from the chronicler's perspective, says not only was his house blessed, but everything he did was blessed. But it was only three months. The blessings was so incredible that word got to the king and King David said, if he can do it at Obed-Edom's house, I need to rethink this pause and this procession to the city of Jerusalem. But what caught my attention is that it was only three months. But this ain't the first house that the ark of God had been stationed at. Remember that they were bringing it from a man by the name of Abinadad's house. It had been at his house for 20 years. But we never hear of how Abinadad's house was blessed. For 20 years... We hear nothing about how his house is blessed, how he's prospering, how all he did is successful. But when it gets to Obed-Edom's house, it's only there for three months. But in three months, he prospers. His household prospers. He, everything he does is successful. And I began to ask the question, God, what was the difference? You was at Abinadad's house for 20 years and nothing was said, no prosperity was shown, but just three months, you ended up hanging out at Obed-Edom's house, and everything he did, his household is blessed, and everything he had succeeded. What was the difference? Please help me, God, because I need to know what's the secret sauce. How can you be in a space for 20 years and nothing take place, but you just in one space for three months and overflowing blessings take place? And God said, Goody, I'm glad you asked. He said... The Thank you for joining us. If you were blessed by today's message, there are several ways to view it again for free and play it back anytime and anywhere. Visit our YouTube channel, TBC Augusta GA, and our website, tbcaugusta.org. You can also download the Tab Impact app from the Apple Store or Google Play. As always, thank you for worshiping with us at the most impactful place on the planet, the historic Tabernacle Baptist Church.